Chapter 11 I've got a friend. I'll be all right. I'll be all right, Matt told himself as he sat next to Israel, who had fallen asleep with his arm over Matt's shoulder. Matt tried closing his eyes, but he was too frightened to sleep as he watched the soldiers that were gathering on the shore. Matt hadn't spent much time away from home, except for summer visits to his grandparents, and even then his parents had called him on the phone every other day to see how he was doing. He closed his eyes now and imagined that he was talking to his mother on the phone. Oh, hi mom, how are you? Me? Oh, I'm great. I'm just hanging out in the 18th century. Behave myself? Don't worry, Mom. George Washington and a few of his friends are here to see to that. Home? I don't know when I'll be back, but I will come back. I promise. But what if he couldn't get back? How would his parents feel with both their children missing? Matt began to imagine his mother's face as she looked into their bedrooms at night, only to find their beds empty. I'll get back. Don't worry, Mom. Somehow I'll figure a way, and I will get back, Matt said as he hugged his knees to his chest. For the first time in his life, Matt was glad he had done his homework. If he hadn't done that history report, he probably wouldn't even know where he was right now. He looked to his left and saw a group of soldiers unloading a large cannon. He noticed that they were all dressed in the same uniforms, with blue coats, dirty buff pants, and blue stockings. Most of them were wearing black three-cornered hats. They had ropes and hatchets tied to white straps that crisscrossed their chests. A dozen men had rolled the cannon off the boat and were trying to pull it onto the shore. Suddenly, a large, heavy-set officer approached. Matt could tell that he was an officer of high rank from his ornate uniform and sword. "'Major Crane,' the officer bellowed in a deep voice. "'Have the three-pounders come ashore yet?' "'No,' the major answered. "'We've been waiting for them.' "'There will be another scow crossing. "'They should be on it,' the colonel told him. "'Go easy on the men, John. "'They have a good piece of work to do yet,' he said, "'nodding to the group of soldiers who were dragging the cannon. "'Yes, sir, Colonel Knox,' the major replied. "'Matt couldn't believe his ears. "'It's Henry Knox. "'It's really him,' he thought excitedly. "'Matt had written three whole pages of his history report "'on the remarkable feats of Henry Knox "'and the men of his artillery division.' He watched as a huge Colonel Knox directed another group of soldiers in unloading some smaller guns. So that would, that's what the bookseller from Boston looks like, Matt thought, smiling to himself. He remembered reading how the 280-pound Henry had turned his bookstore in Boston over to his brother so that he could join up and fight the British. Henry Knox was a patriot at heart and couldn't bear to see his country under the unfair rule of King George. He was smart and strong and full of spirit, and so even though he lacked experience, Henry Knox was given command of the Continental Artillery Regiment. He had led an expedition all the way up to Fort Ticonderoga in order to round up some big guns, much needed in the Boston siege. Overcoming incredible obstacles, he had led his men back 300 miles to Boston, dragging some 50 cannons, howitzers, and mortars on ox-drawn sledges. Matt remembered reading that, without Henry Knox and his artillery, many a battle would have been lost. Matt also knew that General Washington was depending on these remaining 18 guns for his attack on Trenton. As Matt sat watching, he saw General Washington approach Colonel Knox and Major Crane. Henry Knox looked at the general and shook his head. "'We're hours behind with this darn storm,' he muttered. "'It will surely be daybreak before we can reach the town.' General Washington looked out across the river. Yes, this storm works against us, he said, frowning. And yet, it may work with us, for if this turbulence continues, God granting, the day will be dark. It's a miracle we haven't lost a boat yet, with all this ice, Major Crane sighed. If we could only expedite the crossing, he complained. Patience, John, patience, the general whispered, placing his hand on the young officer's shoulder. It was a gesture that reminded Matt of his own father. Just last Saturday night, they had stood that way out in their backyard. Matt remembered how impatiently he had been waiting for a hamburger as his father stood cooking them over the grill. Hang on, Chant, Mr. Carlton had chided, while Matt shifted from foot to foot impatiently. We've got to let this cow cook a bit, his father laughed, putting his hand on Matt's shoulder. You've just got to learn to be more patient, Matt. If only you could see me now, Dad, Matt thought sleepily. You wouldn't believe how patient I've become, sitting here waiting for George Washington to lead me into battle. As Matt fell asleep, he began to dream of being at home in his backyard with his family. He felt safe and warm and at peace. Colonel Knox suddenly appeared in the dream, saying, "'Come on now, lads. Hurry up, hurry up!' The colonel's voice was suddenly getting louder as Matt began to wake up. "'Hurry up, hurry up now, lads!' the colonel called, nudging Matt and then Israel. Matt rubbed his eyes in confusion. "'Dad?' Matt said sleepily. 
You won't be seeing your dad today, lad. Come along. We've got to catch up to General Green's patrol. Hurry now on your feet, a deep voice called. Matt opened his eyes and found Captain McCallie standing before him. He blinked hard, feeling as if he were waking from one dream into another. As Matt stood up, he noticed that Israel had slumped over beside him. He was still asleep. Israel? Matt shook him gently. We've got to go now, Matt whispered. Israel opened his eyes, but it took a long while for him to fully wake up, and he seemed to have a hard time standing. Are you okay, Matt asked, helping him to his feet. Okay, Israel shook his head. What is an okay, he asked in a weak voice. All right, are you all right? You don't look so good, old Golt, Matt said softly. Israel smiled weakly. And you've got the mug of King George's horse. Now help me with my pack, will you, Master Bright Eyes? Sure, Matt whispered, helping him to lift his pack onto his back. They walked side by side in line with four other soldiers. With each step, Matt felt the full fury of the storm as the wind ripped through the trees, sending icy branches across the road. Up ahead, they could just make out the dim glow of a lantern that one of the soldiers was carrying. The light flickered faintly as the snow threatened to extinguish the, extinguish the flame. Matt felt like he was in the middle of a hurricane. The snow mixed with sleet cut into his face, and he buried his head in his sweatshirt. When he did steal a glance at the other men, Matt could see that they were all moving forward with heads lowered, following almost blindly the steps of those before them. As Matt trudged along, looking neither to the left or the right, he thought about these soldiers. He knew that for security's sake, most of the men knew nothing of their destination. For many, it was enough to know they were, riding the, they were ridding the colonies of the tyrannical rule of King George and the heavy dax, taxes he had imposed on them. He thought about men like Henry Knox, who believed in freedom and were willing to give up their lives for that cause. And yet for others, like Israel, six dollars a month was enough to bring them into the face of battle. Six dollars, Matt muttered as a sharp stone cut into his linen-bound foot. I could spend that much in six minutes at the mall. Not that there is a mall anywhere near here, he thought gloomily, looking into the darkened woods. What I wouldn't give to see a mall right now, with heat and electric lights and restaurants and shoe stores. But that's all 200 years away. I've got to figure out a way to get us home, he thought, stepping through an icy puddle. I wish I was home. I wish I was home right now. Chapter 12 Matt had never experienced such a storm. He couldn't even remember the last time he had been out in the rain. And when he finally did remember, he realized it was just to run a few feet from the car to the store. What I wouldn't give for a ride in a nice big heated car, he thought. And it wouldn't even have to have a radio. He wiped at his nose, which had begun to run again, and he began to wonder if his body would ever stop hurting. He was trying to figure out which part hurt most, his chat face or his frozen fingers, when he suddenly felt the cold ice seeping into his linen-bound foot. He groaned with each step that his left that his left foot felt a little wetter, but he kept his groans as low as he could and hoped they wouldn't be heard over the wind. When he looked at Israel, Matt saw his friend's head bent down into his chest. The rags that Israel had wrapped around the top of his head were frozen, and the snow was beginning, beginning to pile up on them, so that he looked as if he were wearing a white cap. Every now and then Israel would stop, as a fit of coughing overtook him. Matt would wait beside him, not knowing how to help him. Matt tried looking around to see where they were, but it was all a blur of snow and trees. They could have been walking in circles for all he knew. After they had marched for what seemed like hours, the low voice of an officer called for them to halt. As Matt stood in line, a group of officers rode up beside him on horseback. Israel reached out and pulled Matt from the edge of the road, for one horse had nearly stepped on Matt's foot. Together, the two friends silently watched as a group of officers held a short meeting. Matt and Israel could just make out the conversation. Our orders are to break the detachment into two divisions, a burly-looking lieutenant was explaining. General Sullivan will lead the march along the River Road, and General Washington and General Green will take a column along the Pennington Road. The distance both divisions are traveling is roughly the same. Upon forcing the outguards, you're to push directly into the town, that we may charge the enemy before they have time to form. His Excellency is determined that our destiny be decided this night. He beseeches you to instill in your men the necessity to bring down every Hessian until Trenton is freed of their scourge. For if we find defeat here, Philadelphia is surely lost. So that's it, Israel whispered to Matt as the officer rode off. I knew when they ordered three days' rations that we were up for some endeavor. It's the Hessians in Trenton, is it? Have you ever seen one of those giants? Giants? What do you mean giants, Matt gulped? 
I've heard that most are as tall as three men, Israel told him, rocking in place. Matt began rocking also, for it seemed too painfully cold to stand still for any length of time. They're sent straight from hell, a stocky drummer who was standing in their line whispered. They wear their hair down to their waist like barbarians, and they take no quarters. No quarters? Matt looked over to Israel. Henry Scudder, this is Matthew Carlton. Matthew's new to this army life, Israel explained with a cough. What Henry means is no mercy, Matthew. The Hessians would sooner run you through with their bayonets than have to look at you. They're mercenaries, you see. Paid to kill and come all the way from Hesha to do it. You can bet they didn't know a patriot from a Tory till they landed here. They don't care who their victims be, just as long as there is gold in their pockets, Henry added. Oh, this camp bitch has got me legs so raw that me breeches are stuck fast, he moaned, pulling at his pants. Do you really think they're that bad, Matt whispered, trying to keep the trembling out of his voice. Me legs? Aye, the blazing itch has spread straight to me shins, Henry groaned. But Israel noticed Matt's worried look. You just stay close to me, little goat, he smiled. Together we'll take care of those Hessians. We're a team, he said, his voice breaking into another cough. When we come up against that bloodthirsty lot, you'll be needing more than Master Gates here, Henry grumbled. He looked down and adjusted the strap that held his drum. Matt was suddenly curious. Henry, why is your coat red? Isn't that the color of the enemy? Matt wanted to know. Henry shudders, cocked his head, and smirked. You are new to army life, aren't you? He shook his head. Just how old are you anyway, he asked. Ten, uh, ten and a half, really, Matt answered, trying to sound as old as he could. I suppose that explains it, the freckle-faced Henry sighed, and it seemed a very mature sigh to Matt, who didn't know that Henry was just three years older than he. I'm the drummer for my regiment, so my colors are reversed. Our company wears blue jackets with red facings, so my coat is red with blue facings, Henry explained. An officer has got to pick out his drummer in battle to give the signals, Israel told Matt. It's often so hard to see, what with cannon fire and gun smoke, that it would take too long to go looking for a face. So the drummer is in opposite colors and can be recognized that easy. Just as he finished his explanation, Israel was seized with another fit of coughing. He had been coughing from the beginning of the march, but had kept his head low in his coat to muffle the sound. Matt turned and looked behind him. The snow had let up, and as far back as he could see, there were soldiers and artillery on the road. The view from the front was the same. He suddenly felt trapped. There could be no turning back now. He would actually have to face those bloodthirsty Hessians. Matt stood shivering and wondering what they would really be like. He knew that the Americans had won the Battle of Trenton, but he didn't know how many rebels were killed in the attack. He seemed to remember from his report that there were only a few casualties. Matt felt a sudden wave of terror overcome him as he realized he could now be one of those few.